Welcome to The Crossing. Those of you who are in here with us online, we're so glad you've chosen to spend a Sunday morning with us continuing through the Sermon on the Mount. I wonder how many of you in here today are worried. Statistically, um, 60% of people deal with worry every single day. So statistically, more than half of you are worrying about something uh, today. You've got an ongoing burden. You're trying to figure something out. You're trying to fix something. You're trying to have control over something, something you want to change. Or maybe it's some, something in someone else's life, a loved one's life, or there's an appointment coming up, or a conversation need to be had, or a decision to be made, and, and it's stirring up inside. Or maybe it's more specific. Like maybe your firstborn is getting ready to graduate high school and go to college in 127 days, and you're worried about <laughs> that or something like that. Are you worried today? If you are, you're not alone. Worry affects every single one of us, from child to parent, from executive to uh, stay-at-home mom, from college kids to retirees. It can infiltrate every, uh, every part of our lives and permeate all of our relationships and steal our joy and even stunt our spiritual growth. Worrying is a problem. The World Health Organization says that Americans have a big problem with this issue than anyone else on the planet. If you can imagine, the most affluent society in the world is the most worry-filled society in the world. So for those of you who are Americans, congratulations, you win on something we probably didn't want to win at. And we live in a culture today where worry is almost a commonly accepted part of life. And it's not just in our culture today. Uh, worry is not a new phenomenon. This was a, a thing in Jesus' day, too. And so, in his Sermon on the Mount, he addresses it. On Sundays at the Crossing, uh, since February, really, we've been making our way through Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. You'll find it in the Bible, uh, book of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And we've been really trying to just understand what Jesus says, and, and then what it would mean if we took his words, well, seriously. The Sermon on the Mount was originally preached to Jesus' earliest followers on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee. His intent was to help them understand what, uh, what life in his kingdom was like, living under his rule and his reign, King Jesus. And so we've listened to him and we've heard time hearing from him what it actually means to be blessed. We've understood the, what true righteousness looks like and, and how uh, kingdom people use their influence in this world. We've heard the truth behind anger and lust and lies. Jesus instructs his followers to love their enemies, which seems a little counterintuitive until we realize that's exactly what he did for us on the cross when he loved us and gave his life for us. We've heard Jesus' words about giving and praying and fasting and choosing who is the true master of your life. In fact, today's passage comes right off the heels of that last one. If you were here last week, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, uh, the concluding statement of Jesus, he says, no one can serve two masters. You'll either, you're going to hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and God. Money. Now, that word money is a really not a, is a poor translation. The word is mammon, which is more than money. It's be better translated treasured possessions. Essentially, Jesus is saying you can't serve both God and your appetite for more stuff. And so we're going to be continuing in Matthew chapter, chapter 6 today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And because of this master issue, choosing, figuring out who is master of my life and, and living with someone other than Jesus and being our master, Jesus' next words are in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. He begins, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. And Jesus seems to connect worrying with the identity of who our master is. The source of our worry is most likely tied to who or what is most important in our lives. And it's a big deal for Jesus and the people he's preaching to on this particular day. In fact, Jesus takes up more real estate in the whole Sermon on the Mount about this topic of worrying than he does about any other topic in the whole thing. And I have to believe it's because worry takes a barometer reading of who truly is Lord and leader and king of our lives. Ultimately, our worries are an indicator of who we are putting our trust in. 
Now, as we get into this passage about worrying today, let me be clear up front. Worry is not the same as anxiety. Worry is rooted in reason. It's, it's logical. It's objective. It's rational. It's usually based on something that's, that's coming up in the future. You have a conversation that needs to be had, or, or you have a, a, an appointment to be made, or you've got a, an assignment to do, or a presentation to give. And, and when worry sets up physically, it's usually, think, nervous stomach, and that usually that feeling goes away after the fact, right? It's kind of fleeting. Anxiety is not like that. Anxiety is often illogical and irrational and unpredictable, and it can be paralyzing, and everything can be going great until these feelings and these thoughts come flying out of nowhere and knock you down. And Jesus, here in the Sermon on the Mount, is not talking about an anxiety disorder when he says, do not worry. When we read it in context, that's very clear. In context, I think it's fair to suggest Jesus saying, if God is your master, verse 25, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or, or drink. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about your body or, or what you're going to wear. And then Jesus asks a rhetorical question. He does this a lot. If you've read the Gospels, he, he likes to ask rhetorical questions, questions that kind of you don't really need an answer. He's not expecting a response. And in this passage today, he, he asks four of them. This is the first one. He says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is not your life more than food and your body more than clothes? And of course, the answer is, well, yeah, life's more than food and clothing. And then in verse 26, out of nowhere, he just says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And can any of you, uh, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? I don't know about you, but when I do read this passage, this sermon, I, it feels a little out of left field, just, hey, look at the birds. But seriously... When's the last time you stopped and considered the birds? See, when you take the time to sit and, and take a moment to breathe and watch the birds and the squirrels and the bees buzzing around the flowers, what you'll notice is that God is present and active everywhere. You can see his providence everywhere when you take a moment to look around. What worrying does is overwhelm us in the moment and prevent us from remembering God's activity. And so maybe you start with the birds outside. It's as if Jesus is saying, if he, if he takes care of the birds, because birds don't compare to you. You are the pinnacle of God's creation, the crowning glory of all of God's creation. You're the only creature who's made in his image. Do you know how valuable you are? We're going to come back to that question in a little bit. And Jesus is funny. He just asks, honestly, can your worrying really change anything? I mean, can you add an, an hour to your life by worrying? No, of course we can't do that. That's rhetorical as well. We actually lose time when we worry, right? Verse 28. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin Yet I tell you that not even King Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which are here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. The word pagans sounds a little harsh, doesn't it? It simply means someone who doesn't know Jesus as Lord and leader, someone who is of this world, right? Someone who conforms to the pattern of this world, who's running after, who's seeking first the things that the world has, who's seeking more, right? The, 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 they're more treasured possessions. I just need more stuff. But, but Jesus' followers trust in what Jesus says, that our Heavenly Father knows what we need and when we need it. And so instead of running after these things, Jesus instructs us in a different pursuit in verse 33. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. 
Here's the kingdom promise for kingdom people. When we live under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, that's seeking his kingdom first. And when we run after, when, or as he said earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, back in chapter 5, when we hunger and we thirst for his righteousness, God takes care of all the things that we need. And the idea is to focus on, uh, to want, to act in a way that keeps us aimed at that goal, not in putting all our energy into worrying about things that are outside of our control. It's like how an Olympic athlete aims their whole life toward a gold medal. A Jesus follower aims their whole entire life toward his will and his want. And then Jesus concludes with just one last reminder not to worry in verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 through 34. Do not worry, Jesus says it three times. And as a reminder that this is written to those who are kingdom dwellers, who are Jesus followers, you are not of this world anymore. You're not seeking to accumulate more treasured possessions. Jesus is Lord, and if he is Lord and master, there's no need to worry And so the question begs to be asked, then why do we do it so much? I mean, really, deep down, we know it doesn't help, right? We know how much worrying can can mess with our lives. And I think if we really take a moment to think about it, we realize that the majority of things we worry about are things we've told ourselves a story about, and we've created this and inflated this situation much to it. We don't even know what's going to happen, and yet we get all stirred up about it for a time. So why do we do it? I asked some of my friends about that exact question. I know for some friends that I've talked to, it's almost as if their body craves it. Worry makes them feel at home. Other friends have described it as their minds don't know how to engage with the world in, when, they, when they get up in the morning until they find something to stress about. And that's almost, almost comforting. For some, worry is a result of of things feeling out of their control. I won't ask you to raise your hand on that one. Still others worry as they try to predict the future and avoid unpleasant surprises. If I can figure out what's going to happen, my life will be happy and perfect all the time. I think there's another reason. And and I think all those reasons are are, are valid, and maybe this is the core reason, maybe it's underneath these things. And I think Jesus hints at it, when he asked this rhetorical question back in verse 26 about the birds. Are you not much more valuable than they? And it may just be that for your particular brand of worry, you don't believe that you're more valuable than the birds. Let me say it a different way. I think you know you're more valuable than birds. But deep down... Maybe you don't believe that you're so valuable that God would would pay attention to you, would take care of you, would provide for you. I I think this, this passage raises some really convicting questions that we have to wrestle with. Do you trust that God is for you? Do you trust that he's moving toward you, fighting for you, longing not to rebuke you and put you in your place because you're not supposed to worry, but rather to come alongside and tenderly provide for you? Do you trust that's true? As we meditate on Jesus' words here in Matthew chapter 6 and seek to take him seriously, I think what we can unpack is that the cure for worry is, is twofold. First, the cure for worry begins with, I need to see myself more clearly. This is so important because for so many of us, at the core of our worry is the idea that, that we have to fight because we're not valuable enough for God to fight for us. And that's a lie. Just we'll throw that out there. That's a lie. That's not true. And that's why it's so important that we take the words of the Bible so seriously. I, I want to share with you just a, a few things that the Bible says about you. The place I run to when I find myself just overly worried about something is the same place. It's one whole chapter in the book of Psalms, Psalm 139. The whole chapter is about what God thinks about you, and it starts off by saying, He knows you, like everything there is to know about you. He knows when you lay down, when you get up. He knows every word you're going to say before you say it. He created you in the most marvelous way. 
when he took time and care and thought and he wove you together in your mother's womb exactly the way he wanted you to be. And then he promises he'll always be with you. Which means he not only loves you, but he likes you. And he sees you. You have inherent, built-in dignity and value in the eyes of your creator. 1 John chapter 3 tells us that God has lavished his love on us and claimed us as his own child. In John 15, Jesus just says, you're my friend. He calls you his friend. Psalm 55 reminds us that he pays so close attention to us that he even collects our tears, the things that stir us up and and cause such sorrow and grief and heartache. God cares so much, he pays so much attention that he collects them. Revelation 5 tells us he also collects our prayers. You know there's a bowl in heaven with your name on it that has your prayers, their pleasing aroma to him? He's so close and he cares so much. We need to see ourselves the way he does. Because, see, when we worry, we're agreeing with the lie that we aren't valuable enough for the Lord to take care of us. All the while, time and time again, he's proven that he's his love for you through his care for you. He's given you every, everything you need to have a godly life. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in Jesus He's forgiven your sins and thrown them to the deepest part of the ocean to remember them no more. If you don't believe me that God's taking care of you, hmm, take a look at the birds. Take a look at the flowers and see how they grow. I'll say one more. Look at the cross of Calvary and the empty tomb in the garden where God demonstrated his love for you that while you were still a sinner, he died for you. The cure for worry begins with seeing ourselves more clearly. And secondly, we need to see God more clearly. I'd love to just read you this passage and be like, look, I told you, God provides for you. Don't worry. But if, if you've ever worried before, you know when somebody tells you not to worry, that's not ultimately very helpful, right? Like that's, hey, thanks. <laughs> so let me remind you today that our God is a God who's present. God is 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 present to the things you and I overlook, like the birds, like the flowers. He's present to things that you don't even know need attention. He's present to every element, every molecule, every particle of all of his creation, nurturing and and taking care of and guiding and giving an opportunity to embrace his love and, and to trust him, because that's the other thing. Not only is God present, but he's trustworthy. And when we see him more clearly, we realize he's worthy of our trust. Because we acknowledged earlier, our worries are ultimately an indicator of of who we're putting our trust in. And when we see God clearly, we understand he alone, as Lord and Master, can be Lord and Master because he alone is worthy of our trust. This, uh, This word trust has been heavy in my head these last few weeks. I I read a book called Trust. Uh, by Dr. Henry Cloud, and in it, he describes what he calls the five essentials for trust. Here are the five, understanding, motive, ability, character, track record. And all five of these things have to be present for someone in order for us to trust someone. First, for someone to be trusted, they need to understand you. For you and I, our greatest desire from the womb to the tomb is to be known and to be understood. And if, and if someone, if we don't believe that someone's willing to know us or take the time to understand us, we're not going to trust them with anything. The second essential motive simply is that we believe that they're for us. That they're not just so self-centered, they only care about themselves, they actually care about us and they're for us. And then there's ability. Do they have the ability to guard and deliver results on whatever I've entrusted to them, whether it's a a secret or a confession or a child or a job at work? Can they handle it? Character is the fourth essential. Does the person have the character, the personal makeup to be trusted? Do they have integrity? Are they faithful? Do they have compassion and honesty? And lastly, do they have a track record? Have they proven themselves over and over through time that they can be trusted? Now, when I read these kinds of things, I always run them through the same filter, and so I find myself asking myself, what if we applied these to God? Especially when it comes to the things that we worry about. 
Understanding. Does God understand us and, and know what we're going through? Hebrews chapter 4 reminds us that we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He understands you and me because he's been there, done that. He's been through it all. But what about his motives? Is he for us? Listen to the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for me, who could be against me? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Oh yeah, God is for you. He gave up his son for you. Okay, that sounds good, but what about his ability? Does God have the ability to handle the things you're worried about? If you might consider yourself a worry wart or someone who worries often, I would, I would ask you to prominently put 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 somewhere where you can see it. Listen to what it says. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What about his character? Will God's character hold? The Bible says the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that will always hold because as God himself said in Malachi chapter 3, I, the Lord, do not change. And so we're left with his track record. Does God have a track record of proving that he's trustworthy? You may have heard Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Paul reminds us in 2 Timothy 2 that if we are faithless, he remains faithful because God, his way, is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all those who take refuge in him. Friends, when worry strikes, you and I have got to see God more clearly. Because when we do, we'll understand immediately that he indeed is worthy of our trust. He alone checks every one of these essentials every time without fail, never lets us down. He can be trusted with every worry that we face. And when we know that and when we trust him as Lord and Savior, worry and stress can take a back seat to well, to our faith in him. Last month, uh, March 17th, was St. Patrick's Day. Maybe you were green that day. Maybe you made the mistake of eating corned beef and cabbage that day. I don't, maybe that's the thing you do. Or if you're smart, you just had a shamrock shake. It happened last month. But St. Patrick, I don't know if you know this, he's a real person. He wasn't someone, you know, who drove the snakes out of Ireland with the flute. That's a legend. That's not real. But he was a missionary to Ireland. And he was a man of great faith. In fact, his unwavering faith is a great example of, of someone who understood this exact teaching of Jesus we're looking at today in Matthew 6. Rather than worrying about his life, uh, Patrick recognized the presence of the Lord everywhere he went. Th there's a really famous prayer that, that he is accredited with praying called the Breastplate of St. Patrick. And his prayer captures his this vision of, of, of a God who is ever-present and totally trustworthy, the same God you and I follow who weaves himself into every breath, every moment, every facet of our existence. Listen to his prayer. It simply says, Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my left, Christ on my right, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. You see, Patrick knew this. We have a God who is always present. 
We have a God who's always moving, a God who takes care of the birds even though they don't know how to ask, a God who takes care of all the flowers even though they don't know how to say thank you. We have a God who is nurturing to all of our needs even though we may not know we have them. He's compassionate. He's able. He knows what you're going through and he's for you. So see yourself more clearly by seeing God more clearly and trust him. Celebrate the presence of a trustworthy God who's always present and is always enough. And do not worry about your life. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I'll be honest, when I read this passage, it's hard. Sounds like you're just saying, stop worrying. And there's not really a to-do we can do just to make ourselves not worry. It's more of a belief thing and believing that you are who you say you are, that you are good, that we have great value because you say so. And so I pray, God, you would give each one of us faith. And when times arise that, that we are worrying about the things of this world, the things of our lives, Will you provide? Will you not? How are we going to get through this? What are we going to do that we would run to you and trust you because you are our great provider? Every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of heavenly lights. And so may we declare together that we trust you. So you tell us not to worry about our lives. Jesus, we need your help. Help us. In Christ's name, amen.